Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got some brothers on the line right now. Yes. We got MC8, we got James McDonald, and we got Steel of the Gangster Chronicles podcast. Welcome, fellas. What's, What's cracking, man? man? Good luck. Hey. Now, you know, I'm excited about all the podcasts that we launching on the Black Effect Podcast Network, but this podcast I was already a fan of, man. My man Glasses from Long, he put me on to them, and, and I've been hooked ever since, and it, it's a blessing to partner with them, and now they've added the legendary MC8 to the mix. Mob James, my guy, still salute to y'all brothers. Thank you for the partnership. Yes, and, yes, and, and, and tell the folks, what is the Gangster Chronicles podcast? Man, the Gangster Chronicles podcast, man, pretty much just sheds light on light on everything that's in the streets, man. You know, from um, gangsters, ballers, d boys, um, crooked cops, bank robbers. We don't have some everybody on the show, but it's it's um it's not to sensationalize crime or anything like that. It's just to show how people can easily fall into that lifestyle. So it's more of an educational thing. So let me ask you a question. So we people to talk about things like that. Like, is it ever difficult to have people recall stories? Because, you know, there's that whole code. And they don't well, get locked up. Well, yeah, but you got people that don't do your time already. And they're not necessarily talking about nobody else's story. They're talking about their own. And, and we have a policy on the show to where we kind of um, vet people before they come on. You know, just to make sure they 100, because we get all kind of emails of people telling us they don't did this, did that. Turn out they phony is, you know, five <laughs> uh, is a four dollar bill, you know. But um, we ask them ahead of time, is there anything that you don't want to talk about? So we already know in there that's not our thing to go in there and try to just drag somebody when they own there to try to get the just juice out of them. You know what I mean? What's the craziest story that you guys have heard? You know, doing this something that you was like, wow, I can't believe we actually spoke to this individual and what he did. James, you got that? I, yeah, I ain't, I ain't heard too many wild stories like that. I think everybody was like, my story was was like a wow, but I don't think we ever had a story that we just like, oh my God, these dudes. I mean, Norm, what you think? Well, you got to remember, James don't have like an extraordinary life, man. Yeah, my, like, James, like, James, James story Martin, should be so, a movie so, by himself. Exactly. I, I, what I get from it is basically um, it's just the insight on trying to, you know, uh, shed light on, on brothers who, you know, was in this lifestyle who maybe been incarcerated or whatever. And then I even got questions to some of the guests, you know, uh, like the show we taped today, you know what I'm saying? I was just intrigued by, you know, the stories hearing back from back in the days from the seventies and, you know, to how, uh, uh, dudes got into the lifestyle and basically uh, were trapped in their environment. So it's just an intriguing podcast for dudes who ain't tuned in or for people who just, you know, getting hip to it. You know, we just basically just try to focus on, try to ask those questions that people might be curious about knowing what we've been through in this type of situation. You know, eight, I feel like it's an easy transition for you just because of your, your storytelling abilities. This, you know, you, you, you've been telling us your gangster chronicles on, on wax forever. I mean, I'm right. I, you know, that that was my thing. Like I tell people, you know, when I uh, started making records, man, it was basically just to shed the light on uh, situations that I've seen growing up. You know, me and me and James been in similar situations as far as being a part of gangs or whatever. So, you know, me making records was always that aspect, not to glorify the gangster lifestyle, but basically show you the pitfalls and the consequences of being in it. So. Exactly. When they asked me to join the podcast, man, I was all for it. You know what I'm saying? Because, like you said, it was just an easy thing. You know what I'm saying? Being mm-hmm. being from the streets, being from Compton, and seeing hands on, you know, it was it was a no brainer. Man, I was so happy when you joined because you know I'm not I'm not from LA, so I don't know who got real stripes and who don't. So I told Still, I said, man, you know y'all. I said I just feel like it's missing an OG a OG rapper, like somebody who really. Lived the life, and I had you in mind, but I didn't know, so I ain't say nothing. And still was like, well, "What about eight? I was like, "Hell yeah!" That's exactly who I was thinking about. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, it, it, it was. It was definitely a good bet because you know, at first, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know what we was gonna do or who we, we was gonna have. And when they came with eight, okay, I could do eight. Uh, we could do that. And man, it's been good ever since. Uh, I'm still getting to know him. And, and, you know, you got to look at it like this. Eight was from the other side, and, and 
his music against DJ Quick music, I was on DJ Quick's side. And now here I am doing a podcast with this man. And, you know, we don't know when you when you start dealing with somebody, man, you get to know the person. Don't look at the blood and crypt thing of it, that aspect. And, man, I'm, I'm glad you're on the team. I'm Isn't glad that, you're on the team. That's good, though, right? It's good that bloods and crypts can work together, right? It shows maturity to me. You know what I'm saying? It just shows mature, maturity and what we've been through and where we come from. And this what it, this what it, what it, what it's about in the first place, man. Just trying to unify brothers from the streets and try to show that it's a better pathway than what we used to and what we was taught as youngsters. You know what I'm saying? So definitely, I mean, I associate with a lot of bloods. Me and Quick is cool as is a fan today. Uh, I deal with a lot of bloods in the industry. And it's just a beautiful thing when you can come together and put aside the differences. When right? you get to a point where you don't care anymore, you know, because right, like when we just got on the call before we started taping, I mean, I didn't, you, I didn't care if you were blood crip or you didn't care if I was or Latin King. We were just talking about our kids. We were like, "Yo, how's your kid doing? Oh, your kid plays, you know, he's a quarterback. Oh, seven or seven, yeah, the tournaments. Like, it doesn't matter anymore. When do you get to that age where it's like, you know what? It don't matter. We we got kids. We're grown ass men. That's childish stuff. You in a gang, Evie? No, I'm not. I'm just saying, but <laughs> because of themselves. <laughs> but I'm saying I didn't care, and then they were talking you. to each other. That's grown men. That's grown men right there. So that's what I've learned over the years, as far as what I've seen, and when I started gang banging and from the tr- transition of having kids to now, man, you you just I mean, I just want to live and be cool with everybody. I want to go where I want to go. Want to have no beef with nobody. Shake the brother's hand, give him a what's up, and keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? That's what it's about to me. And if we can make money together and handle business, that's an extra. Absolutely. Now, now, now Mob, you know your, your movie, your story should definitely be a movie. You you were the you were the muscle in death row, right? Yeah, yeah. I was the I was the beginning. Um, I was the guy that brought all the all the all the homeboys to uh, sure. Uh, I gave him what he needed, and in a sense, I kind of regret it. But I mean, we was having fun at that time, and and we was getting paid for for beating up people, so I, it was fun. <laughs> why you regret it? You, you know what I'm saying? Why why you regret it? Well, this is my brother right here. I I had to bring him on here with me. I lost my brother behind it. Hmm. And uh, I regret that part of it because, you know, he lost his life. If, you know, I think if I wouldn't have brought him to to the situation, he'd still be here. Right. But unfortunately, you know, we lost a lot of a lot of people dealing with death row and he was one of them. So. You know, it, it it had it had its ups and downs. So, me me bringing everybody to him pretty much made sure what he what he was then. Mm-hmm. And without them, it showed that he wasn't what people think he is. So, like I said, it it, it has its ups and downs to it. But you know, I lost more than everybody. Right. Uh. And what's your relationship with Suge now? Or do y'all still speak or not at all? Uh, well, him being in jail, it ain't like I can call him direct. But you know, I shot him. I shot him some money once. Uh, only on the fact that when I got out of prison, he looked out for me. He came straight to me and looked out for me. So just on that tip, I felt that you know I know what it's like being in prison. So I shot him some money. Gotcha. And you know. I really don't have anything to say to Suge or about him. It's been a long time, and I'm trying to, like, let that go. Mm-hmm. And if he reached out, I reach out. I, I holler at him, but I really don't got nothing to say to him. Gotcha. Do you, do you feel like the work that you put in was, was, was properly compensated? Cause, I mean, like you said, you you beat people up for, for, for death row. Like, you hurt people for death row. No, at the end of the day, I mean... I mean, we we all left and walked out of there broke. We lost our lives. We back in the neighborhood, and no, we didn't. We didn't. No, not at all. Not at all. Everybody that worked for Death Row is back where they where they started. It's just like a we had it and then we lost it, mm-hmm. and we never. Nobody never got that that bag to where we can go and do our own thing, and. 
here we are just sitting here and and nothing. No, nobody, nobody came up. Nobody did nothing. Not even him. Gotcha. So at the end of the day, I ain't mad because I mean he doing 28 years. Um, do I think 28 years was enough for all the shit that happened? Now, nah. um, I'm just trying to get over it, move on, and 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 do my thing. I'm finally just getting over it and not celebrating my brother's birthday and feeling like I normally feel, mm -hmm. you know, on that day. I'm I'm just trying to move on. Gotcha. And but, you know, doing the podcast has helped me, you know, get along, helped me do that. Um, I'm able to speak and tell my story. And, you know, I, I, I like the fact that people gravitate to what I'm talking about. And just keeping it 100, I think that's what they like. So just the biggest question 100. everybody I'm sure will have, and I'm sure, I know you answered it before, but this is, this is a different platform. Were you there the night that Tupac was killed? Were you around that night since you were the muscle? You know, where were you? I was working 662. That was your club. Working, yeah, I was working 662. And my brother and some of the other homies was was with Shug and them, walking with Shug and them at the fights. Mm -hmm. So when when the car pulled up at 662, that's when everybody was alerted because I knew who they were. And I gave them the heads up on that. And it went from there, you know what I'm saying? It went from from having a good time to Tupac trying to fit in. You know what I'm saying? He was in a, he he put himself in a situation that you had 15 other cats that was getting paid to do that. And he took it upon himself to do to do him, should I say. Right. So he, he didn't, didn't, he, he didn't have to go him. swing on dude, is what you're saying. Oh no, not at all. And 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 you know, I say this right now today. Tupac didn't hang in Compton, so Tupac never knew who this this young man was. So, you know, for one of the homies to get at him and whisper in his ear and tell him, there he go right there, uh, was like out of line, out of character, mm -hmm. what kind of gangster, what I mean, what what what's your fucking problem? Go get him. You know, I mean, we've been having a beef with those cats for, for quite a while. So it should have been on point right then and there. Let's get it without a Tupac being involved. And, you know, Suge allowed him to act a certain kind of way. Instead of being an artist, he let him be a gang member. He let him hang around the muscle. And he shouldn't have never did that. Uh, hey, 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 what's the balance between that, though, man? What's the balance between being a real gangbanger and being a rapper in L.A.? I mean, it comes with the territory. I mean, if you if you gangbanging and you turn into a rap artist or whatever, it still doesn't it, it that that doesn't register with deal with dudes still stuck in the neighborhood. I mean, it's a thin line because you're still trying to. You're still trying to stay affiliated and so you and stay a, uh, show your affiliation and your love for the neighborhood, so to speak, whatever. But then you want to live the rapper lifestyle and, and be praised and sell records and tour and all that. So uh, it's a hard line, man, when you cross that when you cross into that field, becoming a rap artist, because me, I was gangbanging to the fullest and I started making records. But. I never thought of uh, uh, the fame part of it, you know. I just wanted to make records about the neighborhood. So I still was getting into situations as if I was still a regular affiliate gangbanger, you know. But I took that on because it was more important. It was more important to me at that time to stay noticed and affiliated than to embrace the hip hop. Uh, culture as far as being an artist so i had to deal with the beefs i had to deal with shootings i had to deal with you know just enemy neighborhood beefs all that because i didn't want to transition from being that dude in the neighborhood to being 
uh, uh, artist. And I think sometimes it makes you glorify a little bit more because now you got a little cash, you got a little people, mm -hmm. more hangers on, you got a little, you got a little more looky loops and females and whatever. So now it makes you extra instead of thinking like, you know, I'm get, I could get out of this and embrace this other lifestyle and live differently. Some of us wanted to, it, it generated more. You remember what I'm saying? It, it made us more courage or more, uh, uh, wanted us more affiliated to let people know about the hood. So to me, it wasn't, it's never, it's never, uh, it's never a glorification thing or a good thing for dudes who come from the gangbang lifestyle and into the rap field, because a lot of us still want to embrace the gangbang lifestyle because uh, of our affiliation and where we from. So it can be hard at times, you know what I'm saying? Because you're going to be subject to what dudes still go through in the neighborhood situations. How hmm. different do you think it is today than when it was back then for the younger artists? Back in my days, we really didn't try to, we really didn't try to glorify our neighborhood, so to speak. I mean, you know, back then, you know, uh, we put on a Raiders hat and a pair of khakis and a t-shirt and people automatically uh, associated us with gang banging. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to say, uh, I'm from X, Y, Z hood or whatever. I think nowadays, um, it's commercialized a lot. You get me? And because in my days, record companies wouldn't touch you. If you said you was from X, Y, Z hood or you wore red bandanas or we couldn't do that. You you wouldn't hear music on the radios when people talking about I'm from this hood and I'm from this hood and that hood. I think it's been I think it's openly accepted now because it's is is monetized money. You can make mm -hmm. money off of it, right? The labels don't care. Back in my day, Sony wouldn't dare have me on a video with blue rags and throwing up sets. It would have never flew. Because it was a different standard, I guess, to them, they were still. But now, shoot, you got so many dudes who claiming and representing and it's making money because they're selling records. So now it's accepted. And I think that's the difference about it in today. Well, we, would get, bad, man. we would get stickered up on records, you know. Mm -hmm. Let me come out wearing, you know, crip rags around my head and 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 had a jacket on that said where I was from. There was no way uh, MTV or BET or whoever would have played it. Radio stations wouldn't have played it. Record labels wouldn't have put it out because that was the standard back then. You know, they knew what gang banging was back then. Now, oh shoot, so-and-so said he was from this set. He put on some red and blue bandanas and he got a billion followers on so-and-so on platform. So that's what's changed about it to me. Now, at, at what point, still, still, I want to ask you this question. At what point is at what point is it okay for gangsters to start telling those old war stories? You know what, man? I think as long as they telling their truth is cool. Um, I don't think you should drag nobody else's stuff into it, though, because there's definitely, um, there's definitely could be consequences. On, on, in some cases, people can still go get locked up over it. So we kind of tend people when they come in are off the rip. They usually just talking about their stuff. They don't really talk. I don't think there's no time limit because some people got normal lives right now. Mm -hmm. Some people don't want their wife or whoever their kids to know what they had cracking back in 1982 or 1979. They don't move on. You know, some of these dudes is doing way different stuff now in life. You know what I mean? They're doing way different stuff in life. And going back to Envy's question earlier, the craziest story I ever heard was James's. So after hearing his story, <laughs> it was like everything was like Disneyland. You know, you know when Glasses put out that record uh, about a couple of months ago, Tupac must die, and he got a, a lot of flack for it. What, what did you guys think about that song? Well, wow. I'm his manager, and he said right here in um, in my dining room, I told him, I said, "Man, change the title." I even called James and said, and James told him, he said, "Man, it's like you pulling the dude up out the ground and killing him again." Um, I got the record. I think the title was a little bit over the thing, but that's Glasses. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, it was the truth, though. Hmm. Sometimes the truth don't feel good. You know, the thing is, man, everybody loved Tupac music, but like James said, Pac got caught up in some fake gangbang. Yeah, it was beautifully painted, though. He painted that, glasses painted that story amazingly. Yeah, I mean, it was from the perspective of the uh, the, the the alleged killer, so I mean... Yeah, what you did know. you think, James? What did you think, Eight? He did, he did a good job with some of the things, I mean, you know, you should have been more on point with. Uh, it didn't actually happen that way. 
like yeah. with the chain situation, it really didn't happen like that. And I don't know. I didn't really too much deal with Tupac because I, I mean, I didn't like his arrogance. I didn't like how he went from this humble cat when he first came to this crazy out of out of control cat. Mm-hmm. So, but when I when I heard it and I seen it, it was like, oh no, you can't do him like that. I mean, you killed him twice, and to do that is, you know, my personal thing. I said I got to call glasses and talk to him about that one because a lot of people, especially from my neighborhood, that he deal with was feeling a certain kind of way, and <clears throat> after talking to glasses, he did what he what he thought. You know that's his truth, but I was I was a little offended by it. But and I didn't even deal with Tupac like that. But I mean, it, it worked. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I knew Tupac from shows. I mean, I did a couple of shows with him. I mean, of course, we were supposed to do Minister Society together, and it, that fell through because of the difficulties. Um, but as far as the song go with glasses, you know. We over here on the West Coast, we tell stories of graphic nature and it kind of gets the shock value going with some people. Now, of course, if you're a fan of Tupac, you're going to look at it as, you know, as a as a messed up scenario uh, to uh, basically make people go through the situation again or what Pac went through as far as putting out the record. But I mean, that's what we do as West Coast artists in our situations. And that's where we come from. We try to. But he could have, he could have, he could have fixed the title. It shouldn't have been oh, titled. Oh, cool. but, like, but you know, James, like I said, again, once again, uh, rappers over here, like, you know, we like shock value and not saying myself, but certain rappers, you know, they like shock value and a lot of shock value might get you to a different level of, of where you want to be or whatever you're trying to do with the song. And because we discussing it and people talked about it and you got a, a perspective is basically probably what his point was to make the song. Right. Exactly. That's we, what it was. One of the things I told him, um, the title, and like James said, I think that he could have, um, like, you know, when they had the homie getting knocked out in the footlocker and his chain took off his thing, I said, man, uh, even though, as I know Glasses, Glasses don't done blood hood days when people got killed, you know, when he did shows in people's hoods, so he ain't never on no disrespectful stuff. Right. But I told him, I said, man, you know, um, people's perception is reality, so when you see you a crip dude that's making this song, and they show a crip dude knocking his blood dude without him lifting his chain up off his neck. I said, people go feel a certain kind of way. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And um, even though he didn't, that wasn't his attention, that's what people in the streets, they look at that like, hold on, man, he got the homie out here looking like a mark, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. And um, I, I think, man, he's probably one of the most incredible artists at Eels Glasses, um, you know, extremely underrated. Um, and I think sometimes, man, he's so creative with his stuff. He don't think about what the outside people go think until it's done. And I don't think he even care at that point. You know, he he's a real artist. Right. Hey, hey you, uh, Pac was supposed to play Sharif, right, in Menace? Yes. That seems like a total, I mean, from the Pac we knew. That, well, I guess not. That seems like the other side of Pac. I was about to say that seemed like a total 180 from the Pac we knew. But no, that's probably the other side of Pac, right? Right. I mean, um... I mean, we've seen Pac in different roles than what he played in Juice or, uh, you know, the the movies. Uh, it was just that uh, he, they wanted him to play uh, the Muslim cat, Sharif. And I guess from his experience with just doing uh, Juice, uh, he felt like his character should have been explained more. Um from what we had in the script and the storyline, he was just the voice of reason to us, you know, motherfuckers who was doing dirt. He was the voice of reason. Mm -hmm. And he just didn't feel like he should be portrayed that way. I don't know if it was because of who his character was or what he had portrayed in other movies, but he felt like, um, he should be explained to the audience of why, he was the voice of reason mm-hmm. in our group. And he wanted the script to be like, okay, well, if y'all want me to play this dude, then I think y'all should write in the script, 
why I turned into this dude. Why I can't be an AWACS like H? Mm -hmm. Why I can't be an old dog or whatever? Why am I the voice of reason and I'm 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 who I am? So y'all need to explain to the audience and to the people why am I the voice of reason or the logical one? And it it just kept bumping heads, you know, at the readings, at the at the you know all the stuff. Every time it was time for us to meet up, it was just a bump of heads and a clash. So he was let go from the character, you know. So I don't know if they really wanted him in in the first place, but that's what happened. And everybody knows, you know, Tupac. Um, he was very, you know, outspoken when it came to, like like James said, you know, when it came from being the humble cat, the dude that we knew with the humble records and the keep your head up and the Brenda got a baby and stuff mm -hmm. like that. When he turned into the, you know, the hit him up character and, the, you know, the bishop character and it's all about the hood, you know, it, it, it kind of changed things for him and put him in the aspect of where, you know, it was my way of the highway. So. I, I think that's what the, the pitfalls of this L.A. Uh, West Coast gangbanger life, it could lead you down a pathway of 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 not so of not the righteous. You feel me? Mm -hmm. And it can turn you into somebody that, you know, uh, you really you really uh, your character. It could take you to a different side, man. So, so why I nobody ever pulled Pac to the side and told him that, though? I think because of me personally, I think because of who he was and because of he had the limelight of the hip hop business and rapping and, you know, people just, I mean, he was Tupac, you know, you, you see how people flocked and people wanted to generate and be around him and his records and his music. And he was this, he was this larger than life character to some people. So that's just like being in a studio with your homeboy and know damn well he can't rap a goddamn lyric but <laughs> shit everybody in that motherfucker gonna be clapping going man that was the best verse i ever heard and that nigga can't go double wood you know what i'm saying but mm -hmm. you got them dudes who gonna sit right there and pump him up and make him think he's the greatest artist of all time right. they don't want to step on that interference of hey if he come up maybe he gonna bring me along too so yeah i'm gonna pump him up and i'm encouraging knowing he trash and dirt so maybe that was the situation of dudes around Pac who didn't want to because they wanted to go along for that ride. James, are you involved in this death row movie at all? What happened now? Uh, are you involved in this death row movie at all? Oh, no. No. I don't want no parts of death row. Mm -hmm. No parts. Not at all. Right, but, yeah. but, but death row is so much a, a part of your story too, though, right, James? <laughs> It's, it's a part of my story. To let this go right here is to let all of it go. Uh, I had my days with Death Row. Other than that, I mean, I don't want to keep reliving it. Uh, I don't, I don't, like people constantly keep asking questions about Death Row. I wish people let it go. Um, I can't live there no more. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm, I'm not living like that no more. So, I gotta stop hating Shug, so I gotta let that shit go. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just tired of it. And when you go to the neighborhood and you look at half of these cats that that was on death row, half of these cats, like the question y'all just asked, you know, why these cats didn't get Tupac up out of the situation he was in and and let him know his role, you know what I'm saying? Opposed to being one of the homies, this is what you do. You know, you making the money. This is why we got a job. You know, I don't, I didn't, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. I didn't, I didn't see Tupac being from the hood because that, you know, he never broke bread in the hood. He never, he, he, he didn't want the streets like that to be from the hood, let alone put the hood on his, on his body. And you had homies that was putting Tupac face on their body when we lost maybe 20, 30 motherfuckers in, in, in a year. You know what I'm saying? And it didn't make sense to me. So why would I do a movie? I don't I don't want to glorify Death Row. Death Row was, man, it was a nightmare. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't want to have no parts of that. No parts of that. Do, you do know you, what I'm saying? Do you think people mistake, uh, you know, even rappers or even people like yourself, James, expressing the situations that y'all experienced in everyday life as y'all glorifying violence? 
yeah, some some would look at it like that. Um, and we did. You know what I'm saying? And and that's why a lot of stories I don't tell because you would have to explain it in detail what we did. Like, you know, like going to Ruthless Records and getting at Jerry Heller. You know what I'm saying? Uh like like vanilla ice. You know what I'm saying? I stay away from shit like that because the only way you can tell that story is to be 100 with it and, and for people to really understand what happened. So I try to stay away from that type of shit because, you know, like like Norm said, police might be knocking at my door if I if I give you the 100, <laughs> the 100. So I, I stay in my lane. And if you ask that question, yeah, that happened. No, that didn't happen. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he said, yep, yeah, no. You know That's what I'm right. saying? But, but, but for real, a, a lot of shit was blown out of proportion with death row. And and with Shug, you know what I'm saying? They 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 made Shug to look like this this monster when he wasn't. You know what I'm saying? Everything that Shug did, he had to take, you know, a look back and see if everybody was there before he reacted to certain shit. You know what I'm saying? And I wouldn't give, I wouldn't care who understood it. But he wasn't that dude. He wasn't that dude. Uh, I brought Shug in here. Shug had a mom and a daddy and went to college. He wasn't a, a gang member. You know what I'm saying? But the money put him in position to 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 pay for his status. And that's what happened. Yeah. And, and it just it just everything just went left. Once he got the power and he got to paying people, you know, uh Mom James conversation didn't really matter. So you have to bag away because now you finna what what happened, you you wind up killing your own people behind some bullshit. And I don't want to tell too much of that got stuff. You. Yeah, yeah. We, got, we need some of this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We need some of this. Listen, for the here's, the, here, here, here's the thing. We could sit here and talk to the Gangster Chronicles podcast, exactly. Steel and Eight and Mob James all day, but I want y'all to catch up by going to listen to the back catalog of the Gangster Chronicles. And y'all dropped a new episode today, right? Oh, yeah, that came out um, this morning. Who, who's the first guest? Too Short. Wow. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Too Short. Okay. Yes, indeed. We're we, we gonna learn we, anything new about short? Oh man, yeah, for sure. Because on our show, we not the show that you come to when you on your music promo tour because you gotta be of a certain caliber. You gotta be a dude that's you gotta be from the streets. Like, like we could like uh, you know, no disrespect to Drake and nobody. Drake couldn't come on our show though. <laughs> not that he probably wouldn't want to anyway, but you got to have some kind of foot in the streets. We got because we're not going to talk to you about your record or wh who produced this record. We got to go talk to you about, man, the, when you was in jail, did you sock somebody? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like, what was you going gotta, on? You gotta yeah, our, our, come on, gang. Our, 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 our show is not to glorify your hip hop status or your platinum chains or how much money you got. Our show is to try to inform and educate uh, people about the history, about where we come from, as far as uh, how we try to uh, be, how we were products of our environment. And it's about to uh, go at dudes who were really a part of, uh, if you want to say gangster life, but it's not to glorify, it's just to inform people about the real side of 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 what people are really misinformed about of the title gangster or what you might been in. So if you was a dude who came from the streets, who started off, you know, in the neighborhood or hustling or whatever, those are the dudes we want to talk to. We want to talk to people about, you know, the politics of the streets and about the laws we go through right now. So, you know, Gangster Chronicles is not a, like a, a hip hop show about, you know, how many records you sold and what kind of Rolls Royce you pulled up in and what what kind of bottle of drink you got in your hand? It's about the, the true stories of the uh, the misfortunate, you know what I'm saying? So that's what we bring into our show. All right. right. Well, we look right. forward to checking it out. And thank you, brothers, for calling in this morning. And that's right. Keep dropping those hot podcasts. It's, it's, it's available right now on the Black Effect Podcast Network on iHeartRadio, wherever you listen to podcasts, man. Still, eight, Mob James. We're going to do this again soon, man. But thank y'all. Man, appreciate it. All right, brothers. Yeah. Good luck, y'all. Stay up. <laughs> 